way. We all want to see a movement of God. Um, I want to see a movement of God in my life. I'm sure you want to see a movement of God in your life. Uh, it is incredible when we are in the presence of the Lord, and it's incredible when we can see the works of His hands. But sometimes we miss those points. Uh, we miss those obvious uh, moments when God's not only within us, upon us, and producing from us the kind of fruit that we would otherwise desire as Christians. At the present time, at least in our church, we're having an incredible movement of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is a little bit of a testimony or me testifying on a personal basis. But I've been here. I've seen it happen. I've seen it unfold. So who better to report to you what's going on than somebody who is an eyewitness? It's a first-hand account. There's a lot of folks that might have heard of it. There's a lot of folks that might hear about it. Uh, certainly as folks leave this situation when we come together and they're going to tell folks about what God's doing, what the Holy Spirit's doing, folks are going to get excited about it. But until they come here and they experience it and they see it, they're really not going to know it for what it is. And even as much, seeing it is not always believing it. If you don't see it with your own eyes, if you don't experience it in some sort of material way, I'm not sure that it's enough. It's enough to convince you. It's enough to solidify that belief in you, to otherwise let go, to otherwise become then as that vessel that wants to produce that fruit, as otherwise to become involved in a circumstance and situation like that, if you're holding anything back, you're probably precluding yourself from really experiencing it. That's why I feel so blessed. Because in the presence of the Lord, we're seeing blind eyes open. We're seeing the dead arise. And I mean that in a literal way. I mean that also in the sense that there's healings taking place. But I know for a long time, there are people for a long time who have sought the presence of the Lord, the face of God, and have not been able to see Him not been able to find him. Not that he wasn't there, but because they were not prepared. The message this morning is going to be mostly taken from John chapter 10, but the context of it is 9, 10, and 11. Now for me, that's the troublesome part about uh, ministering, troublesome part about teaching, because I want to read the Word. And, and to some extent, for me, the Word stands for itself. It doesn't need interpretation on my behalf or my part. But the troublesome part for me is I have a hard time resisting just reading you the Bible. Now, some of you might say, well, that's okay, because most of us probably don't get enough Bible. But for the sake of the time that we have this morning, I'm going to trust that either as you might be aware of these scriptures, these passages, or that you might perchance, after the message this morning, read them again. I, I hope that you do so that you can find the proof that the Word again may establish itself, that I speak it, you may validate that what I say is true, but that the Word more than just what I say it is, by my authority, by His authority in the Word, might prove itself valid. Because what I'm going to talk about this morning is one of those things that is probably as about as unbelievable as blind eyes being opened and dead being raised. I say that because that's exactly what this, these chapters in John are about. 9, 10, and 11 capture a moment in Jesus' life. It begins with a blind man who he and the disciples meet, seemingly randomly. But if, as you read through, if you follow through 9, 10, and 11, you realize it was, there was no randomness to it. There was a purpose and a plan that God had already established. Just when we pick it up in chapter 9, verse 1, we don't see it until chapter 11 is finished. But when they encountered that blind man... He was without sight. The question arose, why? Which is an obvious question, especially since some see and others don't. But the question only has an answer when you see it within the proper, again, context. And Jesus immediately sets that and establishes that. It's not about the individual personally, at least not initially. It's about the purposes of God. And how could we speak about Jesus or how could we study the Word without seeing everything that we read within the context of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior? Because that's exactly what that was about. That's exactly what it is about. That's exactly what it will be about. But Jesus says it wasn't because of Him. It wasn't because of His family. 
it was because of sin in general, but it was more so about his establishment, God establishing in Christ the authority to correct that circumstance. That's a hard thing for us to comprehend because we're always wanting to prevent. But you know, the Bible is not entirely, if anything, about prevention. It may have been in the Garden of Eden, but it was only for a short duration. Everything from that point where Adam and Eve fell in, in their iniquity to sin by prompting the devil, it's all been about restoration. The way that seems right to us is to prevent it. The way that seems right to God is to correct it, to restore, to revitalize, to bring forth out of what appears to be blind, what appears to be ignorance, what appears to be misunderstanding, wandering around aimlessly, no purpose, no plan in your life. God wants to take that and turn it around to some great purpose that you can't even see yet. But it's got to start somewhere. In the same vein, we're all dead. We know that. We know that unto sin, unto iniquity, unto the transgression of Adam and Eve. It is the curse. But to know how to get out of that situation is more than just hearing about it. It's more than just somebody coming like I am this morning or as I am this morning and testifying to it. It's seeing it with your own eyes. It's participating in it. It's becoming a vital part or becoming in that being, in that becoming a vital part of it. When the disciples and Jesus met the blind man, that's exactly where this passage, these passages, 9, 10, 11, begins and otherwise, I believe, cements and establishes for all the witnesses that were there the truth of who Jesus Christ was. Now, there are two judgments, at least that I'm aware of, and I don't want to talk about this in terms of theology because I'm not sure I could speak of it with uh, proper authority. But you may find this to be true even as you put it against the theology, the biblical uh, basis. The first judgment is our own. God gives us the power out of liberty, out of choice to judge. The second judgment, however, is His. Now, we have a choice in that judgment, either to turn that over to Him and be led and prompted of Him, or we could do it on our own. If we do it on our own, without that prompting from Him, without that reverence for Him, reference for Him, without the apprehension and the awareness of Jesus Christ and the allowance of Him, Christ in us, to come forth, then we will be accountable for what fruit we bear. I think that's a solid biblical premise. That's when God's judgment comes in. Does God help us along the way? Amen. He does. He prompts us. The Holy Spirit is continually at work trying to bring forth an awareness and understanding so that we might then walk in the light as He is in the light so that we might produce the fruit that He's called us to. But at the same time, if we reject that, if you read it, as we do today, if you heard it as they did then, as someone told you about it, as you then maybe didn't get to see it exactly, but you heard about it, but if you did see it exactly, how could you deny it? Except that your heart was hardened. Except that in your liberty, in your choice, in your initial judgment, you made the determination that what you saw was not what you were going to believe. How literal could it be? Here was a blind man from birth, had no understanding, no one understood why. There was no cause, cause effect, that idea of prevention. If there was, we could maybe undo it or we could do it differently. He just was. The emphasis was upon Jesus coming to restore. So Jesus dispels that very quickly, that notion. He says it's about right here and right now. And it's about me. Christ Jesus says I could speak for him. Having the power and the authority to bring forth healing. Literally so with the blind man. But more than that, there was an awareness that was established not only for the blind man, but for the disciples. An understanding that was birthed at that moment, even within the context of the culture in which he lived. That was going to set up and establish not only what Jesus could do, if one would believe, but who he really was so that not only in a literal sense, in the immediate moment, the healing that takes place, the deliverance that takes place, but in a longer term context that he was indeed the Savior. He had come back to save, to restore. As a good shepherd, he had collected the sheep. He would put them together in such a way that God could preserve them and deliver them unto the ultimate of healings. 
And that's overcoming not only illness and infirmity, but it's overcoming the grave. Now, from the very immediate moment that that person was healed became the contentions, or at least the contentions proceeded forth. Uh, it was not only the Sadducees and Pharisees or the religious leaders of the time that took contention with Christ. Anything from healing on the Sabbath day to, well, how could somebody like Jesus, who we know, who's been with us, hanging around with us, how could he do such things? And then also there was on the good, some that said, well, how could even as Christ would be possibly a sin or in sin doing this, this is a sin, how could he do it? What good things? How could they ever be associated with bad? So much for insight. Because when you come to this church, as I hope you would go to any church, and you would see the movement of the Holy Spirit, and you would begin to see the fruit that that produces, how could you deny it? But I know, I know, it's the human nature to contend. It's the human nature to question. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't compute to me. How can blind men see? How could this Jesus come to save us in an immediate sense, but also long term? Now, if we proceed on to chapter 10, John 10, we're introduced to at least the concept that Jesus has come, not only with some initial awareness or insight, but has come with improper authority to shepherd us. Christ makes a strong case, at least in the first initial chapters of John 10, that he is the shepherd. He also makes the case that he is from God. And that was, again, what most of the Sadducees, Pharisees, the Jewish hierarchy had contention with, was that he was not only Jesus, maybe that he could do this thing, but that he was contending that he was the Son of God. But if I'm going to ask you, if I'm going to ask you this morning to at least appreciate that idea that it's hard to see, I believe what you even see, how much more what you can't see. Up to that point, no one had looked upon the face of God. Up to that point, no one saw in a material sort of way what they thought God was going to be. In a very literal, material sense, a king. Someone to save them in a very material and literal way. And at that point, that had not materialized because they were in bondage. Though they were in liberty to make a choice, they were under the sway and influence of someone else. And it was imposed upon them. The Romans had dominion over them. They were allowed to play church. They were allowed to operate as in some sort of context of that spiritual community that God had set forth as with Abraham, had called forth as with Abraham and set into motion. But they really had no power and they had no authority. So at that point, they were just trying to make do. They were just trying to get by. They were trying to explain away why, well, you know, the blind can be healed. They can see. But, you know, if you don't see it here, if you don't experience it here amongst us, it's because we're just not there yet. It's because it's not happened yet. It's because Christ has not come in a way that otherwise would empower us. The Christ has not come in a way that otherwise would empower us to accomplish that end. Especially if you don't see the dead raised. Now, we've got to give them this at least. It was only about half of them that had any belief in a resurrection. The other half didn't believe in it at all. So their contention was, once it's over, it's over. At least the half that did not believe. So what more than to convince them that there was a life after death? Much more so that the Messiah was now here amongst them. Again, they would not confess that. Their awareness was not to the point yet where they could maybe even articulate that. But it was undeniably so. Jesus Christ was in their presence. He was already moving. The Holy Spirit was already in him, upon him, and with him, and beginning to change the circumstances beginning to bring forth fruit that they had never seen before, was literally an empowerment to them to overcome anything that the adversary, including Rome, would have brought against them and put them in bondage to. Jesus says, I am the shepherd. By whose authority? By God's authority. Again, John chapter 10. He further says, they know my voice, they that believe. And that's really what I'm calling you to this morning. 
If you don't see it and accept it and receive it as it is supernaturally dispensed and given, you don't believe it. And if you don't believe it, you don't operate in it. Now, can you have a little bit of belief? I do think you can have a little bit of belief because that's really the whole motion of this, this series of chapters. Starts with a little bit of belief, requires an element of faith, it produces some fruit, and out of that faith and that fruit, there comes obedience to do a little bit more. And then it's added to. Is everybody there? Not yet, not until Jesus comes again. Are we empowered spiritually to be there? Amen and yes. But if you don't allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you and you don't recognize as He speaks to you, that's Jesus' voice, that's God's voice speaking to you, you're not going to walk with that authority. You're going to be doing what they were doing at the time, settling for far less than what they were either called to, intention to, authored by God to become. They were going to live in this situation where the devil, or as in Rome, had them in bondage. They could not move without checking it out with Caesar first. Now they tried to play that to their advantage because anything that moved outside of what they did, they took immediately to Caesar, Caesar or at least Rome. Look what they're doing. They're, they're going against you. You won't let us go against you. We're not going to go against you because we believe that you are emperor. Not for the Christians, though. They weren't called Christians at that time, but not for the followers of Christ. Because that's what Jesus was already doing. He was bringing together those who shared common belief, those who shared common heart, but more importantly, those that began at that point to hear the voice of God. And it was speaking a completely different word than what they were familiar with, than what they were hearing. They were hearing, oh, well, and even if there might have been some covert activities, somebody in some dark place, dark room, in a synagogue, under the breath, under the breath, get the microphone on the side, under the breath, this really Emperor Caesar, he really isn't a god, there really is a god. He, they were not declaring that in a way of any authority because they didn't believe that. Now, I don't want to, again, take everything away from them because they still held hope that the Messiah would come. But is that to their credit? I don't think so, because he came. He was there with them, and they denied him. They could not see him. My point is, though seeing is believing, it's not enough. It requires the Holy Spirit, and it requires you to go beyond what you think, what you feel, and what you do. Actualization in a human sense, that's all that it is, is what you think, I think, therefore I am. What you believe, if I think enough, we can put them all together, and then I have a paradigm for my life. And then what I do is going to be based on what I think, what my paradigm for life is, and what I expect my outcomes to be. If that's all you have, I feel sorry for you. Why this church is experiencing the movement of God in the way that it is is because we have broken free of that paradigm. It's not a finished work. But it's an accomplished work in Christ. We are becoming actualized, sanctified, not only physically, mind, emotions, and, and actions, but we've done one other thing. We've added to that the dimension of the Holy Spirit. We bring all of those things of our self-actualization and lay them down at the feet of Jesus. And we recognize that He speaks because He is the Good Shepherd. Now, how we came to that conclusion, though, again, is a matter of not only testimony, but experience. So in chapter 10 of John, Jesus says, He is the shepherd. He exhorts them to listen to Him. And then He does what I'm going to call the coup de grace. Then He does the ultimate. He says something like this. And I, as your shepherd... I'm going to die for you. I'm going to give my life for you in such a way that I'm going to establish once and for all I've got no human motive in this. Or if I have human motive, it's been all aligned with godly motive. If I am responding and doing anything right now, it's because my Father in heaven has told me to do it. He knows me. I know Him. I recognize His voice. He has spoken to me and He has told me this is my calling. And his election was sure. He was called. 
even as we're called. But he did more than that. He elected to follow what the Lord had told him to do. Now you can say, well, he's God. He would know. It's not like he really didn't understand. It's not like he didn't know he's going to end up in heaven or resurrected. He did. He knew all those things. But church, you do too. How do you know it? Because it's in the Word, the Word of God. How do you know it? Because people like me stand in front of you. People better than me stand in front of you and exhort you to it. They teach you about it. They point out with specific reference where that Word is. We also acknowledge what the authority that Word is spoken in and from. We acknowledge that. It is not my Word. It is God's Word. That's why I tell you to read the Bible. Go back and read these chapters, John 9, 10, and 11. I can't do it all here this morning because we wouldn't have time for me to do what I'm trying to do right now, which is bring some relevance to your life. But what authority do you need? Do you need to see it? Do you need to touch it? Do you need to taste it? Do you need to feel it? Will that make a change? Didymus didn't think so. Even in this particular passage, it was Thomas who said, yeah, We'll go back to Jerusalem and we'll get what Lazarus got. They're going to do the same thing to us. And that's what the disciples said. Don't go back there. They're after you. They're going to kill you. I'm jumping a little bit ahead. But even as Jesus said, I'm going to die for you, he knew what was ahead of him. That's the most remarkable thing. He knew what was ahead of him. Is that faith? It has to be. In his flesh, he stepped out in faith and went against what was, at that time, the present culture. Not only in a political way, but in a religious way. He violated every rule, not of the Jews or Rome, but of the belief systems that they were predicated upon. He violated every tenet of humanism. It is not by your thinking that you're going to be saved. It is not by your feeling that you're going to be saved. It's not even by your good acts and deeds you're going to be saved. It's because God loves you. He is willing to die for you so that even as you perish in a world that otherwise operates off of the complete opposite, He promises you not only resurrection now, but resurrection in the hereafter. How do you bring that message to people? How do you deliver unto them in a tangible way those who have not seen anything of that power and authority for at least a while? How do you revive them? You've got to do it. You've got to do it. In case you guys don't recognize, I want you to be thinking about you've got to do it. You've got to do it. So we proceed to chapter 11, and Lazarus is introduced, not for the first time necessarily, but he is introduced within the context of his sickness. Now again, when they asked Jesus in chapter 9, what caused the man's blindness, Christ didn't pin it on any particular person, even the personal, the individual. That's not because he wasn't in sin, or that there wasn't iniquity, or there wasn't a curse. But it's not about that individual so much as, again, recognizing that if Lazarus was sick, if we are sick, it is probably not wholly attributable to us, at least not initially. Now, what point do we, in rejection of Christ, in rejection of the message, in disbelief and doubt, in negating then that promise of deliverance that we become fully culpable? I don't know. I hope no one would get there, but we know people do because we know there's a hell. And it's not that God would send them to hell, but it's that doubt and disbelief that they could not participate and enjoy it. That's what condemns them. But this idea that Lazarus was sick is no different than the idea that we're sick. This idea that Lazarus was sick unto death really is no different than the idea that we are sick unto death. Have I died yet? No. If I died and came back and was resurrected, you could see me again after my death. I was pronounced death. Would you believe? Jesus did that. And he still didn't believe. That's how hardened a heart can become. That's what happens when you attack a paradigm that one is not willing to give up. That's what happens when one doesn't operate out of faith. You don't see the miracles. You don't see the outcome, but more than that, you don't see the resurrection and you don't see the power to overcome. You don't see the Christ. You don't see the resurrected Christ coming back to claim his church. 
Lazarus was dead. We all know the story. My favorite verse, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Lord, he stinketh. Now, I like that because it's kind of funny, right? It's kind of King James funny because we wouldn't say stinketh anymore. But in that obvious sort of deadpan way that English do, he stinketh. Well, obviously he did. Four days, I believe. Four days in the tomb, he was going to smell. But you know, folks, I stinketh. I've got the stench of death upon me. I've got a life, a world, otherwise, that up to this point in my life, I am trying to, with the help of Christ, is turning my life over to Him. I am being sanctified and resurrected, but there's still remnants of that death on me. I still have struggles with that. A day in the past, I would have stunk even more, hopefully. Hopefully in the sense that if I'm around you guys, you don't smell me or don't see it upon me. And hopefully also what you see coming out of me is a resurrected Christ. But that takes me back to my opening comments. If you were in a place where you could see the operation of the Holy Spirit, you could see blind eyes opened and dead people rise, would you not believe it? So what did Jesus have to do to establish it? He had to prove it. He had to show them. He did it in front of witnesses. It was valid and reliable. There is no scientist, no uh, researcher that could question the validity and reliability of Scripture. If only because all, no matter how high-minded, no matter how twisted it might become, this essential element of all empiricism is eyewitness. How many have seen him, touched him, and tasted him in a literal way? How many before him was told about his coming, and that in itself established that? How many now that have followed after in faith continue to operate, and we continue to see the fruits? How more valid could that be? Lazarus would have been a good enough testimony. Lazarus, come forth! I'd love to have been there. Would you not have loved to have been there? Because already what swirled around him was doubt and disbelief. Questioning, well, you know, who is this guy? He claims to be the Messiah. He claims to be God. He heals on the Sabbath day as if that were the most important of all the considerations, but it's all they had to hold on to. I don't think he can do it. I mean, we're going to sit in a congregation here this morning in a few moments, and there's going to be people here who are going to think that same thing. Well, you know, it's really great. I enjoy it, but I really don't know if they can do it. Now, they're not going to articulate that, hopefully, and I'm not, I don't want to cast any shadows over anybody or I don't want to criticize anybody that would join us here this morning or in uh, context of the internet. If you're listening to me now, seeing me now, and you're not able to be with us in physical presence, I don't want to make it sound like you're a loser or something, there's a problem with you. I'm saying it's a human nature to doubt. But I'm also saying this, if you come here and you see it and you begin to experience it and you begin to feel it and it goes beyond your thoughts, your feelings, and your traditional actions, you may just want to give it some consideration because there's a movement afoot that's a spiritual one that defies all of those things. But it doesn't define the sense of discounting the empiricism, the obviousness. It really gives us an explanation. It's not about prevention. It's about restoration. Jesus has come to restore. Jesus has come to bring forth his church out of what otherwise was a lost circumstance and situation. When he called Lazarus forth from the grave, what he basically did was, he said in a very literal way, Church, come forth out of the grave with your death clothes on you, with all the bondage that that represents, with all the deadness of mind, the deadness of feeling, the deadness of action. When you're dead, you're dead. You don't move. You sit in your seat. You don't move. You don't testify of the Lord. You don't move. You don't share a word, a word that you may not think is important, but a word God has put upon your heart to speak as with spiritual authority. Again, His word. You know the shepherd. Listen to His voice. If He speaks to you from within, you must act. Because if you don't, you're dead. And you're going to stink. And He's not going to be able to use you. And he's not going to cast you into hell, so to speak. But your actions require that you are rendered useless to the kingdom. And if you're defiant enough, you may actually work counter to him. 
Jesus said that. He said he's come to restore sight to the blind, but he also said in judgment he's going to blind even those that at this point see somewhat. Because that's the way human nature is. Once you sell out, you're sold, and it's tough to come back. It's tough. It takes a supernatural action to accomplish that. Lazarus was raised from the dead. He was a living testimony. They all saw it. Still some who disbelieved. But was that enough? No coincidence that at that time they were approaching the Passover. No coincidence that at that point, leaving Bethany, Jesus moved back to where John first met him, and he was baptized in the River Jordan. He continued to heal while all this continued to percolate. Who is he? We saw him. He healed the blind. He raised the dead. Who is he? Who is this church that we're hearing about? Who are these people that defy logic? Who are these people that break, break rank with culture? Who are these people that believe otherwise that there's a supernatural power that can deliver unto them the power of the Holy Spirit such that they may see the works of Jesus Christ in their presence? Who is this people? And where do they come from? The people who believe. The people who share a heart. The people who have accepted that they've got to die to themselves so that the resurrected Christ can come forth. Do they do it without any proof? No. Do they do it without any somebody coming along and opening their eyes? No. But if your eyes have been opened, if the word's been delivered unto you and your heart's been pricked, and you've got some conviction going on inside of your heart... And then you begin to see the work of the Holy Spirit. You begin to feel the love that is here as people love on one another. You begin to feel the conviction. Good shepherds will die for their sheep. Good shepherds will lay down their life for those that are lost. Good shepherds will go the, the final mile to accomplish the end that they have been given. The hireling is the one that sneaks in. The hireling is the one that takes it and steals it. The good shepherd earns it. People are not going to believe, even if they see it and experience it. But they need to at least, if they're here, give it a shot. Give it a chance. Open up your heart. Listen. We know what happens then when he returns to Jerusalem. We know what happens when even as Caiaphas, which I think is the most fascinating thing too, Caiaphas, the high priest of the time, really prophetically says, it's better this man die for all than all perish. And he also, in continuing that, says, he's going to draw us all together. He's going to create again this powerful body that's going to change the world. But we know as Christ came back, they began immediately to apprehend him. And whether they did it out of good spirit or bad spirit, they did the same thing to him. They crucified him. They put him on a cross, mock trial, false accusations, lies, deceits, lie, kill, kill, steal, and destroy, all of the devil. It's all the devil's work. Christ laid down his life, though. Christ did not let them take his life from them. The title of the Sunday school class We've got about five minutes. It's probably good that I tell you what it is. I lay down my life. John chapter 9, I think it's verse 10. Or John 10, maybe verse 9. Chad, do you have it back there? Chad's not back there. <laughs> Seth, do you have it? Believe me, it's there. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I laid down my life that I might take it again. Thank you, Seth. Folks, I picked that one verse 
in the midst of all these chapters, in the midst of all these verses, in the midst of all these things I could have chased after this morning and made the point with, because it's your choice this morning. Are you going to lay down your life so that God can take it back up again, so that you might be resurrected in the Christ Jesus, so that you might accomplish not only those things that He accomplished, but more. Are you going to seize the moment that God has given you to empower you and enact in you the salvation message, so that you might be not only in word, thought, not only in emotion, not only in action, but in Holy Spirit, the Christ, resurrected. Made a big deal. Jesus did. You guys say that you are of the Father. What am I saying if I say this very same thing? I am the Son of God. I'm saying the same thing to you this morning. You say you are the Father. It's okay to say you're the Son of God. Not of yourself, not of humanism, not of self-actualization, but of the power of the Holy Spirit. But I tell you what it's going to require. You're going to have to die to all those things that otherwise might corrupt. And the major corruption, the primary corruption is doubt and disbelief. You've got to overcome that and step out in faith. You could try to argue against it, but you'd be falling into it. You could try to rebel against those that would want to take you into captivity and do this thing to you. But you'd be arguing against the power and the authority that it holds, that God holds. You're much better to submit and let him do it through you. You won't do it alone. We got a church filled with people who love the Lord. We got a church filled with people who could exhort, who can share, a word of God, not only from the word, but out of their heart. And it's valid. It's reliable. We are seeing people opening their eyes for the first time. We're seeing people who were otherwise dead, had no power, no authority, find a power and authority to change lives, to change cultures, to change situations. But it all required them to step out in faith. If this scripture is true, therefore doth my Father love me. And Jesus said that. He loves me. But because he loves me, and I know what I am to be in him, I know what I am to do, I will voluntarily go. I don't have any sort of fears. Feed my sheep. Jesus met with Peter. Feed my sheep. You'll stretch forth your hands, Peter. And there'll be others that take you to your destiny. But it's not them, it's God. They're just ambassadors. Even if they're not the ones that you think are going to come and get you and take you, you go. Because when you go, you go with my power and my authority. And when you go, you're going into the very heart of the devil and changing that circumstance and situation. That's our calling, church. Make sure your election is sure. Make sure that you know what it is that you're committed to. Because if you do, I promise you, it will not only be as with Elijah and Elisha. It will not only be a portion, but it will be a double portion. And it will be beyond your wildest imaginings. And if we want to see the resurrected Christ, it begins with us. It begins here. I want to say a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we've had this morning. We pray that the word has been delivered properly. We pray it's been delivered as you've put it upon my heart, Lord. We pray that it has an audience not only with those in this congregation this morning that's sitting before me, but whoever might be listening to it throughout the world, Lord, right now, we pray that it would have not only an audience, but even as this scripture, these passages was presented, that there would be eyes opened, that that word would then be at least in a pricked heart received to some extent. 
that there be accommodations made, that assimilation of that word would be taken in. It would begin to change thoughts. It would begin to change paradigms. It would cast down vain imaginings, all things that would exalt themselves against your mighty word, Lord, that in that there would be a power that would come out of that to overcome the adversary. We defeat the adversary not by cunningness, not by devised fables, Lord, but by a literal presence of the Holy Spirit. He brings forth life from within us, but out of that life we begin to bear fruit. There is an obedience that comes forth from that, that conviction, that belief, that begins to change cultures, begins to change environments, begins to change the world. We are a light on a hill. We are a candle that is lit, Lord, and we want to be that for a world that otherwise is in darkness, cannot see, and an otherwise a world that is bound in death. Otherwise, a world that is cursed, not by you necessarily, but by the residuals of the devil that continues to convince them they can't do this thing. I pray right now with the same authority Jesus Christ did, Lazarus, come forth out of this body. Let us be a walking, talking testimony of the power and the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Again, we love you. We thank you. We thank you for the hearts that, again, are joined together in your name, Jesus. And we thank you that you did that thing. You put yourself in that position of the cross so that we might have that point where we can rally around and become one with you and you can lead us to the victory that God promises us. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.